Mad Max is a very iconic character. How did this resonate with you and how did you make it your own? For me, the stunt double or for Tom? I mean, yes, I'm sorry, for Tom. Um, um, <laughs> um, uh, how did I make uh, Mad Max my own? I don't, that's a, oof, that's a difficult question because ultimately, um, obviously Mad Max is synonymous with Mel Gibson and uh, he is Max and that's it. There's no, there's no gray area there uh, for me. Um, so initially, I, you know, I was, I, I, initially I was not only really excited to play, I would be offered the opportunity to play um, Mad Max in, uh, in Fury Road by George Miller, but I was a little bit intimidated by having to, to, to step into a pre-existing iconic character as the new, the new boy, you know, as it were. So, um, I did have thoughts of trying to make it my own, but that's not, I don't think, the right way of approaching something like this. So um, what, I, you know, the, what I realized was that actually George Miller created the world of, of Mad Max and, um, and, the, you know, and the apocalyptic landscape that um, Mad Max is you know, synonymous with. And ultimately, he's uh, George's character. So all the answers lay really with George and what he wanted me to do with it to transmute his vision you know, for this re, and, you know, revisit to the world, you know, since the last 37 years of meditation on Mad Max for George, if that makes sense. Now, this wall-to-wall -wall action, and there's a lot of physicality to this uh, role, how did you prepare for it, or did you pre have to do a lot of preparation for it? I mean, you've always got to be sort of physically fit and adaptable to whatever the environment is that you're going into as a performer um, to get the best out of yourself and to be of most use to the, you know, as an asset to, to the production. Um, on, on this one, it was very <coughs> methodical in many ways because it's a, it's a live action movie and some of the, or well, most of, if not all of it, is, is, uh, is a very ambitious succession of, of very difficult stunts, um, including vehicles and, and stuntmen and characters, you know, which have to be seamlessly cohesive in a narrative form on the screen as a movie. So because there was no CGI or, you know, um, face replacement and, and, all, and stuff like that, um, it had to be very carefully threaded together. So Jacob and I both had a very sort of harmonious um, departmental relationship to, to create a, a, a fully dimensional max, which you couldn't, as an audience member, see who was who, when, and where, if that makes sense, during the film. So that's how we prepared, really, was just a, as they, it was an interdepartmental puzzle. And I am sort of like the acting department, if that makes sense, and right. Jacob was, and you know. Jake. Right. Physical. So did you do? You did some of the stunts. Of course, there was a. Jacob, you did. Yeah, he had majority. no choice really yeah, <laughs> about that. We had we, we threw him in as much as possible, and it is our job uh, as stunt doubles to to uh, to map out the scene and, and do the rehearsals, but then to to get the actor in as much as possible. And, and Tom's very capable of doing most of it himself. And yeah, like I said, didn't have much choice in the matter. So was it this this film relies heavily, I, I believe, on on. Um, not so much dialogue, but more like even just glances and sometimes even silence. Was that a challenge to to play that character? Not really. No, I mean you don't. I, I don't think um, when it, 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 uh, so to tell a story in physical action is, is is one has to have a clear arc of what what it is that you're trying to achieve as uh, when you're playing a character. So what happens to a character along their journey and where do they end up? And we have you know as as actors we, we have the ability to to see behind the curtain and know where our character's gonna end up. So you, you're just joining the dots. In fact, not speaking is a lot easier than speaking uh, in, in many ways, especially with something like this where things are happening to you and you're just reacting to an environment and a landscape which is fully articulated. So um, no, that's not difficult. And I think um, <clears throat> it's, what George has done is made a world which is incredibly from design right through to mythology and, um, and asset-wise, very complex, a very complex beast. He simplified that, um, and the lack of dialogue, you know, actually is, is part of that simplification process. But it was an, in, an a massive, a massive beast to, to, as it were, to to wrangle into creating this relentless and spectacular, epic live-action movie that is Mad Max Fury Road. You know. Now, the, I, talk about um, Mad Max's relationship with Furiosa. Is she sort of a? a female version of Mad Max? 
Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, what's again, George is never is, is kind of restless in, uh, and his imagination is so vast um, that the, it was only logical that over since Thunderdome, his, his, he's obviously developed and grown the world of uh, the apocalyptic landscape that for, for want of a bit of a terminology and the characters and the tribes within that world. And it's, I think, very brave of him to take the Mad Max um, character uh, that everybody knows synonymously with Mel Gibson, but that world and develop a f further, a new character who's a protagonist and a female Mad Max, as you say, in her own right. And I mean, the, and, the, and the clue is in, in the title, it's Fury Road, and she's called Furiosa. And uh, Mad Max is definitely reintroduced in this in this movie to a, a new generation but also a new character is as well and uh, we follow her and and i think it's, it's, it's brilliant that actually there's a, a female lead you know played and articulated so beautifully by Alice theron who's arguably one of the you know, finest character actors we've got in our generation as well as one of the most exquisitely beautiful women on the planet you know um, with, with such range to to play that part as well so he's given you two mad maxes technically for this generation and one of them is furioso or the counterpart to mel's max as it were now this being a fresh take on mad max do you feel that the fans will be at home the fans of the previous mad max films will be at home with this version uh, i hope they will be you know I, I think it's inevitable that you know with anything like books translating to film or you know old um reinventions of of already um you know much uh loved characters being recreated or redone there's there's always going to be people who, who harbor feelings towards the latter or the older um or the original and rightly so that's the legitimate you know um it's a legitimate um concern but at the same time, this is the man that created Mad Max in the first place, and it's a, it's a further, you know, um, it's a further advancement of his work and meditation on the character that he's created. So, it's of his mind. So, why shouldn't he be allowed to continue to pioneer within that world? You know, just because, you know, he's decided to move forward with a new cast and a new selection of characters. There's no difference in the evolution of that man, George Miller's mind and his world. So. That kind of redundant to, you know, that as a period in time, it continues. You know, it's not like somebody new came in and decided to remake Mad Max. This is a continuation of George's work. Okay, well, great, thank you. Hey there, Valerie here with an interesting fact from the movie The Usual Suspects. During the film, Verbal Kint says the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing men he didn't exist. This quote is from the French poet Charles Baudelaire and it also appears in another movie featuring Gabriel Byrne and Kevin Pollack. End of days. Mm. That's all for today. I'm Valerie and remember to subscribe for all the latest trailers.